Père et du Fils et du Saint-Esprit. Amen. Je vous salue, Marie, pleine de grâce. Le Seigneur est avec vous. Vous êtes bénie entre toutes les femmes et Jésus, le fruit de vos entrailles béni. Sainte Marie, Mère de Dieu, priez pour nous, pauvres pécheurs, maintenant et à l'heure de notre mère, en s'y soit-il. Amen. Au nom du Père et du Fils et du Saint-Esprit. Amen. En s'y soit-il. You see, ouais. I don't know where this amen stuff comes from, you Anglo. It's en s'y soit-il. <laughs> I learned that. I learned that when I was in Quebec a couple of months ago at the district house and the priests, many of them were from France and Switzerland and they kept saying en suisse and I didn't know what it meant. I'd never heard it. Well, what, what is that en suisse? Su- What's that? Thus may it be. Oh, okay. What? Well, yeah. Okay, so uh, it's not amen. I see. No, it, and believe me, growing up, it was always en suisse It en was suisse. never, never amen. That was English and it was Latin. But see, once upon a time, we had, uh, there was a word for it. Uh, no, no, hold on. Don't help me. Foi. That was uh, what we had. Yeah. Of course, you know what a, you know the, uh, the French phrase for a, um, a hangover. What's that? Sunday morning. Crise de foi. Crise de foi. Ah, crisis of faith. Okay. <laughs> oh, crisis of faith. There you go. Oh, so, good, well. good God, let me feel this way. <laughs> Awesome. Brethren in Christ, laudato Jesus Christus. Secula, seculorum. This is Timothy Flanders with the Meaning of Catholic, together with co-host Kennedy Hall and special guest, Mr. Charles Colomb. Mr. Colomb, it's a pleasure to speak with you, as always. Great to be back. Thank you. We are talking today about New France. Mr. Colomb is going to touch on some of the general points about New France. We've been covering New Spain in a different series. And in this show, we're just going to touch on a few of the general points, both in Canadian New France, down into Louisiana, and then down into the Caribbean and Haiti. And uh, I want to start, Mr. Colomb, with your book, Puritan's Empire, page 48. You say this, you are comparing New Spain and New France, and you say, under both powers, there was the same emphasis on correct and impartial administration, education, particularly higher in the arts, and on public and private works of charity. Similarly, there was the same concern for the spiritual and temporal welfare of the Indians and Blacks to a degree simply unheard of in the English colonies. So can you elaborate on the ways that New France essentially does the same thing independently and very much at the same time as these two powers, Catholic powers are at odds with one another very much. They seem to be still doing a similar thing in terms of what sort of a, a good colonialization should be. So can you elaborate on any of those points you make here in the text? Well, I, I certainly can. Um, the first thing, the thing you've got to bear in mind is that France and Spain, both Catholic powers at that time, were still very, although they time had moved on and there had been various developments, the fights with the Protestants in uh, the Huguenot Wars in, uh, in France, um, Nevertheless, they paralleled each other the way all European Catholic kingdoms did. Details would be different, of course, but the basic thrust of the state was the same. Now, at the same time, however, in both countries, more in France and Spain at this point, you did have a a certain amount of centralization that was beginning. Um, The emergence of the modern state, if you will. Originally, the French like the British and the Dutch and so on, had hoped to settle Canada through um, a private corporation, private company. It didn't work out very well. So the king took over administration. Uh, Eventually, in the the 17th century, they began settling the St. Lawrence Valley. Uh, They moved out through the um, uh, Great Lakes. And then finally, in the early 18th century, although they had had, uh, La Salle and people like that up and down the Mississippi. They only started settling in the very late 17th century, early 18th century, Louisiana and the Gulf. The Caribbean, they had already begun settling. Places like Martinique and Guadeloupe, which is still French, and uh, later on Haiti, which was on an island, Hispaniola, that uh, was Spanish. But for various reasons, the Spanish had not settled the uh, western uh, portion of the island. And so the French moved in there, uh, preceded, I have to tell you, by pirates. 
uh, buccaneers. It was partly to uh, expel the buccaneers from the island of Tortuga that the French moved into Haiti in the first place. Uh, originally, and I, I mean at the very beginning, like 1607, they had hoped they would find gold the way the Spanish had. That obviously wasn't going to happen. Uh, and so they turned to other things. Fur in Canada. Uh, and it's very important to bear in mind that the fur trade for all the European nations in that part of the world was extremely lucrative. It went to hats, various other uh, items of clothing that uh, brought a pretty penny in Europe. So that was really that, the fisheries uh, off the Grand Banks, uh, those are the two major industries, you might say, in, in uh, Quebec and the North. Uh, in, the, in the South, in Louisiana, uh, they took to planting things like sugar. Uh, and of course, and also in the West Indian possessions. And from sugar came the real moneymaker. Rum. Exactly. Yep. That, and that, those were the economic inducements to French colonialism. Now, the French were faced with the same problem that the Spanish faced. And that is, the country was so pleasant, it was very difficult to get people to leave. Now, you see, the English had no problem finding people wanting to, wanting to get out of Dodge. And they also uh, brought in people from elsewhere in Europe, Germany, and so on. But with the French and the Spanish, it was pulling teeth to get colonists. Yeah. So what do you do? Well, in the case of the Spanish, uh, the idea was to not only convert the Indians, but make them good Spaniards. Mm -hmm. For the French, and this was really the, the biggest difference between the two, for the French, that would have been both um, numerically difficult and economically unwise. Because the last thing they needed was for the Indians to settle down and become farmers. They needed them for the, for the fur trade. And also to counter the English as the English threat grew, uh, because there were never enough French settled to effectively combat the English colonies to the south. Yeah. So uh, they, um, they fell back on certain interesting, uh, interesting things, though, to attract colonists. Firstly, the seigneurial system uh, allowed uh, the granting by the king of areas along the St. Lawrence River to seigneurs, lords, who were not necessarily noble. The trick with the seigneurie was that, although it kind of ennobled you to have one, uh, you simply had to have sufficient funds to bring over sufficient colonists to work your land and to build a mill and a church and all that kind of thing. Having said that, it still didn't, didn't bring over enough. So then they had a bright idea. We'll send over a regiment of troops to defend the place. And then when they're demobilized 10 years later, we'll give them land if they'll stay, as opposed to a pension if they come home. So the regiment, uh, the Carignan Salière, was sent over. And they, uh, they settled 10 years later. But now there was a problem. No women. Yeah. That was it's a big problem. To bring the fidel wall, right? Exactly right. And the, these ladies are very, very important uh, in our history uh, because, well, you must understand that around France there was a, um, a sort of network of royal abbeys, uh, female abbeys, royal, or and they were orphanages. Yeah. And what would happen is that an orphan girl would be deposited with these people, with these sisters, and they would they would teach them. Uh, household skills, but also to read and write, yeah. which was not common for girls at that time. Moreover, when they came of age, they were in law, the filles du roi, the daughters of the king. And so they received a dowry and had the right to decide for themselves who they would marry. So the king had the bright idea of sending these ladies to Canada, not all of them, actually, and then later Louisiana. So they would get there. They were housed, they, uh, well, they were sent over with chests, hope chests, if you will, filled with various household goods, those are their dowries. And as a result, they're also called the fidu cachet, or the casket girls in the South, the American South. 
they would arrive in Quebec or Montreal or uh, later New Orleans or Mobile, and there were sort of dormitories with house mothers waiting for them. And then they'd be introduced to the local settlers and choose a husband. So they, uh, they then, and this was, a, again, a key part of our linguistic history, they would then uh, take, have children and take over the household. Well, it so happened that in the France of those days of the 17th century, only a minority spoke what we call French. Uh, the majority of Frenchmen spoke various dialects that were at greater or lesser difference from each other. But the Fille du Roi spoke the French of the court, even though they'd never been to Versailles. <laughs> and so that was what they taught their children, which is why, although our French Canadian ancestry actually is heavily on Norman, Breton, and Pauvin in the west of France, but came from all over. Uh, but our dialect is very much descended from 17th century French because that is what our foremothers spoke rather than the various dialects that most of our forefathers spoke. Kind of an interesting thing. Well, having said all of that, uh, the administration in New France was fairly simple. You had in Quebec City a governor general. Uh, you had governors under him at Montreal and Trois-Rivières, and then later uh, Louisiana became a separate colony. Uh, with a governor first at Mobile and then at New Orleans. But here's the big but. You had two other very important officials who were just as important as the governor general, which created a certain amount of internal friction. Uh, the governor general was primarily the military leader and the ceremonial leader. But the intendant, uh, and if you want to know what an intendant, which is what it looks like, is, think of our English word superintendent. That's pretty much, it's the same route. The Intendant was very much the civil leader of the colony, uh, but the boundaries between their authorities were ill-defined. And then you had the bishop. And the Bishop of Quebec was a very, very important personage. Uh, he was in charge, amongst other things, of the many religious orders. And the religious orders did everything we think of as social work. Hospitals, schools, all that was the province of the church, not of the government. Well, a couple of other uh, things to bear in mind. I have mentioned the seigneuries. Well, the lowest element of government was connected to the seigneuries, and these were the parishes. Now, bear in mind that the parish was both a civil and a religious institution. Uh, each parish had a parish council made up of uh, what we call Susan. the Maguillet. Well, no, Susan's at that time. <laughs> no, it's very, very, uh, very, very different from, from our parish councils. Yeah. yeah. Because they had both civil and religious functions. And they were, they were actually concerned with Catholic Orthodoxy, I would imagine, at that time. Well, that too, certainly. <laughs> and the fabric, but they, they kept up the fabric of the church. They took care of the poor. Yeah. And they ran the civil affairs of the parish. Uh, the Seigneur might or might not have been the chairman of the parish council, but he was always the chairman, uh, he was usually the captain of the local militia. But the militia, the parish council, and the Seigneur were always tightly connected. What we uh, consider separation of church and state didn't exist. What you had was a distinction in function. Um, now, what all this led to, actually, was a, a kind of government that on paper was very centralized, but in real life was very decentralized. Kind of the opposite of our government today. Yes, well, anyway, moving along. Uh, I don't want to say anything bad about our modern governments, which are doubtless the best money can buy. Yes. But uh, <laughs> having said that, uh, the the... French settlers were always a small minority. And of course, it's to the Indians uh, and to the missionaries who evangelized them that a lot of the strength of New France and Louisiana came. Well, and it's worth mentioning as well that um, 
major difference between the South and the North is Canada was so sparsely populated at that time oh. that, um, I mean, the estimates on the highest end are four to 500,000, perhaps first nations people between coast to coast to coast. I mean, and you think how big Canada is, there's, that's nothing. I mean, you could go, you could walk for a month and a half and not see another person um, just based on where people lived. So having a colony dealing with the weather and dealing with the fact that, you know, you think about Mexico, there were probably millions of people because it was an amenable climate for growing populations and I don't know, agriculture, oh. et cetera. So it was a very different enterprise, whereas here it was almost like not just colonizing, but starting starting a civilization, not just readapting one, but completely starting one where there was not one and having to implement modern methods. That's very true. They did have to build from scratch and to a yeah. great degree. I mean, uh, certainly mm -hmm. the the... Indian contribution to New France was primarily strategic and economic, yeah. but it was not, there was not a basis there, as you say, there was not a basis there really for the French to build upon, yeah. except that you had the Curie du Bois, the voyageur, who um, actually did much of the exploration and the expansion into the interior. But that expansion was not primarily one of settlements. It was one of trades. You had trading posts. You had portages. You had things that were, we would say today, they didn't leave much of a carbon imprint. Yeah. Uh, now, the, the other, <laughs> I, I couldn't help that. I had to get that in there. But the other thing to bear in mind, too, is that the uh, great distinction that we have today in the Francophone uh, population in Canada is between for want of a better word, the Quebecois, the habitants, what were called in my grandfather's day, just the Canadien and the Acadians, yeah. the Acadien in the Maritimes. Yes, I said the Maritimes, not Atlantic Canada. Sh shoot me. Uh, the Acadians were very much a people apart yep. uh, because they, they came from a particular region for the most part of uh, Poitou. Uh, and they... Their language was different, their dialect was different, yeah. or their history was different. But they were Catholic and they were French. Uh, and there's been a certain amount of intermingling. But I mean, I can remember my great uncle, Andre Sirwa, my great uncle by marriage, was Acadian. Now, nobody looked down on him because he was Acadian. No, but it was always mentioned. Yes. Ah, c'est Yeah. yeah. It, it, it was, it was, and, and again, there was no particular reason that I could discern for it. But you always know, well, yeah, Uncle Andre, he's, he's Canadian. He's uh, Acadian, all right. Yeah, yeah. He's like a yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so we didn't even tell Acadian jokes. So I, I wasn't, I was never quite aware of why we made, we always made the point, but we did. Uh, you know, to this day, for instance, the Southern Gaspé in Quebec, which is a, Peninsula from which my immediate forebears came, uh, Rimouski. Um, yeah. well, that's the most recent uh, settlement of the Coulombs of my branch. But the southern Gaspé that faces uh, New Brunswick mm -hmm. is Acadian settled. And they're very proud of that. They, 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 they'll let you know. At any rate, the south, uh, Louisiana, the settlement there was, was again, very, very difficult. Uh, they, they did the same thing with the Fille du Roi, uh, but there it was a question of sugar plantations and a very different culture, much more, uh, it attempted far more elegance than was possible in Quebec to a great degree. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> uh, well, I mean, the, the Creoles, as they called them, and that's an interesting word that has to be touched on, Creole. Uh, they, they used to say about themselves that they were en sortie de la cuisse de Jupiter, a, a piece of the thigh of Jupiter. Okay. They didn't, yeah, they, they, they didn't suffer uh, self-esteem issues. Yeah. This was not a problem for the Creoles of Louisiana. Uh, but that word Creole, it comes from Spanish, Criollo. Mm. And originally it simply meant anything from the colony including a person born from the colony. Okay. And originally that was just Frenchmen born in Louisiana. 
But something funny happened. And the funny thing was this. The uh, institution of slavery in Louisiana uh, was regulated on something called the Code Noir, the Black Code. And basically, your slaves had to be Catholic. You had to train them up, presuming you owned them as Catholics. But a key difference was this. If you fathered a child on a slave woman, you were obligated by the law to acknowledge the child as your own and to provide for their care and education. That made a big difference. And it led to the rise of a class called the, uh, both in Louisiana and the French Caribbean, of the Jean de Couleur Libre, the free gentleman of color, uh, the Creole de Couleur, the Creoles of color. And from that day to this, both in Louisiana and in Haiti, uh, the Creoles of color have played a very, very important part in history and are still quite prominent in those places. Um, and the thing was, the white Creoles and the Creoles of color were related. There was an old joke in New Orleans that the planters had their white families on Royal Street and their color families on uh, Bourbon. So you see the same last names, very often the same features. Uh, and when eventually Louisiana was incorporated into the United States, this led to a lot of friction because these people were not going to give up their place. Many of them were educated in France, owned plantations and slaves of their own, and they were not going to give up their prominence to a bunch of uh, Anglo whites without a fight. And that that's a side of our history that uh, people generally don't know about, uh, but it's an interesting one. Uh, one of the, uh, I must say, sad elements of Louisiana history is that the Francophone community ended up divided along color lines. Um, and this was a terrible thing because it meant aligning, not that I've got anything against Anglos, of course. Uh, my mother was an Anglo, so I'm, I'm certainly not against them. But uh, how do I put this? They had much more in common with each other than they did with the newcomers. Yeah. And their splitting along colored lines showed a uh, capitulation, shall we say, to the American ethos that we could have done without. <laughs> Certainly that was what, it's what caused the fall of, of uh, the fall of Francophone Louisiana, which, had it not happened, would have, I think it would have enriched the United States tremendously had Louisiana remained somewhat more what it had been. But we digress. So the other uh, French settlements in the interior of the United States were places like Saint Louis, Missouri, Saint Genevieve, uh, Missouri, Prairie de Roche. Uh, Illinois, Vincennes, Indiana. And there are still in some of those places a dialect of French spoken, albeit dying, to this day. Another big French center in the Amer on the American side was Detroit. Detroit. Detroit, very much so. Uh, and interestingly enough, on the Ontario side, yeah. there are still uh, French enclaves that go back to that time, La Salle, South of Windsor, yeah. and places like that. Bell River. But, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But in, in south of Detroit, you've got places like Ecos and River Rouge and Monroe. And to this day, they eat muskrat during Lent, <laughs> which is a direct, a direct uh, holdover from the well, that, French regime. That's muskrat. enough of a water element. What, enough yeah. of a water animal to con yep. be considered a fish? Okay. <laughs> yep. Wow. You can eat just, muskrat just for, on Friday. Just for non-Americans, a, a muskrat is is a type of a rodent that lives in the water, basically yeah. in in the Midwest. Uh, a beaver with attitude. Yeah. <laughs> well, Mr. Colum, I wanted to ask you about uh, the more about the faith in New France, and then about the Métis, and I want Kennedy to get in on any questions he wants to ask here. But um, France often at least in histories i get 
they get a bad uh, reputation because what happens with Richelieu and Louis the Fourteenth and the Thirty Years' War, which they kind of the, they kind of betray the Counter Reformation, the Catholic cause, and the continent. And so yep. there's sort of this this uh, the Bourbon dynasty is very secularizing, leading up to the French Revolution. Now, in your book, you don't see you see, you don't seem to indicate that that made much of an impact on the evangelization efforts in New France. There were still a lot of Jesuits, and still. So, can you t- elaborate more on uh, the evangelization and the spreading of the faith in New France? I, I certainly can. I, I would just like to point out, though, that the uh, there is no doubt that the, uh, for want of a better word, the betrayal of uh, the Counter Reformation by Louis XIII and Richelieu was a, is a terrible blot on French history. It's nothing to be proud of. Having said that, we should also remember that Louis XIII was the one who consecrated France to the Assumption of Our Lady uh, in uh, Thanksgiving for the birth of an heir after 20 years of trying. People forget this, you see. Also, the reason why the, uh, there's the status quo in the Holy Land is that the uh, King Louis XIV used his alliance with the Turks against the Austrians to uh, create a position for the Catholics in the Holy Land. Uh, I mean, and mind you, that doesn't justify what was done. You know, I wouldn't have the double eagle here if I thought otherwise. But it is important to bear in mind that it wasn't all one way. They weren't simply out to be anti-Catholic. Again, as with the uh, racial split in Louisiana, people often put uh, lesser considerations ahead of more important ones in pursuit of what they consider to be their interests. One of the great things about us human beings is that we are masters of self-justification. And that's true of king and commoner alike. So having said that. Oh, and the other thing I should point out too is that throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, the French were the protectors of Catholic missions throughout the world. And when in 1905 uh, they brought in these really anti-clerical laws in the Third Republic, they were specifically not applied to French colonies overseas. And when the Prime Minister was asked why this was, he said, oh, anti-clericalism is not for export. (laughs) <laughs> fair, fair enough. What what did I tell you about self justification? Anyway, the uh, so the thing was that at an early at an early time, the uh, Jesuits began their work uh, under the French agents in uh, in Quebec. Uh, the North American martyrs, of course, very famous. Oddly enough, called the Canadian martyr, martyrs north of the border and the American martyrs south. Yeah. Or the French uh, martyrs, you might say. <laughs> you could say that, because yeah. like they were French and stuff. Yeah. But nobody calls them that. Hmm. But the people like Saint Jean de Brabeuf and uh, Saint uh, Isaac uh, Saint Jogues, Noel Chabonnet, and all those guys, they um, they were a dramatic but a, a numerically small element of the Jesuit efforts in New France, which mm-hmm. were very actually quite successful. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Huron, the Algonquin, even some of the Mohawk, hard to believe, but that's where we got St. Catherine Tequitha. Um, a number of other tribes converted either largely or entirely to Catholicism through the efforts of the Jesuits. And the so called Jesuit relations, the relation, the uh, letters back to France describing what they were doing. Uh, are not only really, really important bits of history, but also pretty fine literature too, because the Jesuits were taught to write. So their, their writing skills are, if you read French, read the relations in the original, they're really quite worth it. If you don't read them in translation, they're still worth it, but anyway. So uh, that was part of it. And of course it's, it's what we remember most today uh, but it's also important to remember that, as I mentioned, the hospitals, the schools, and all that were under the church. And so there were a lot of religious orders uh, of nuns that came to Quebec or were founded in Quebec. Uh, St. Margaret Duville was recently uh, canonized. Um, and I forget if it's to her or someone else. But the Feast of the Holy Family 
originated in Quebec. Yep. And of course, very, very soon, uh, we had apparitions and other sorts of things going on, miraculous healings. And so you had a network of shrines from uh, Notre Dame du Cap and saint anne de Beaupré in Quebec, yep. all the way down the Mississippi to Notre Dame de Secours Perpetuel in uh, New Orleans. Yep. So, uh, and there are to this day, and in particular, Saint Anne has a number of miraculous shrines amongst the French churches in New England. Uh, there's nothing quite as inspiring mm-hmm. as going into a church filled with crutches. That, Amazing the devotion to Saint Joseph in Quebec as well. The Holy yes. Family is just massive in Quebec. It really is. It is, and and I suppose part of the reason, you know, these things reflect each other. You know, you, you when you talk about devotion versus practice, uh, you really get into the chicken and egg. But for all sorts of reasons, the family was extremely important in Quebec, uh, and the devotion of the Holy Family made perfect sense. Because obviously, you know, you you wanted both heavenly protection and a heavenly example. Um, And and the other thing, too, that made uh, made the uh, Quebecois in particular an interesting people, and I don't say that simply because I descend from them, uh, it's because there were so few people that started us out. All French Canadians are related, shallow end of the gene pool, as you might say. Uh, it's, but because our ancestors came from all over France, uh, and because even within the, the primary areas of Normandy, Brittany, and Poitou, there was a lot of, shall we say, genetic variation. We didn't have the same, uh, issues as our, uh, Appalachian friends. There's a, actually a town down the road from me called St. Joseph's. It's, mm-hmm. but it's but it's actually linked to the Quebec devotion to St. Joseph and family of St. Friends and family of St. Andre Bessette are there. So an hour down, 45 minutes down the road in Southwestern Ontario, there is a shrine to St. Joseph with French Canadian origin um, where St. Andre Bessette is venerated. It's just funny how that works. Well, you know, he, uh, St. Andre Bessette, obviously we're we're rushing to the 20th century, but it's worth mentioning him because St. Andre Bessette, uh, It is hard to overemphasize uh, the influence he had during his day. Uh, My own great-grandmother knew him, and uh, she lived in Massachusetts uh, because we're those French Canadians, the New England French. But whenever she had a a deep crisis going on in her life, she'd run up to Montreal and Mm -hmm. speak to Brother Andre, Mm -hmm. who um, always gave her some guidance. And mind you, that's not because he was super special. He was an industrial strength counselor. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the the um, the equivalent for our Irish listeners, I guess, of uh, uh, Solanus Casey in Detroit, right? The that kind of thing. And it's interesting too. You know, we had a, a stigmatic of our own in French New England, Little Rose Ferron of Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Uh, another story for another time, but a very amazing individual. Uh, and who, believe it or not, managed to keep a big chunk of the French Canadians of New England from going the route of the Polish National Catholics. We'll have oh, to good. tell the story of the Sontanel sometime. Excellent. That's uh, Anyway, but to, to get back to the, the original question, the faith became an integral part of French Canadian culture. And one of the things that makes the Revolution Tonquis of the 60s so worthless and pathetic, and I mean that in a nice sense. You're being too kind about it. Well, scummy, garbagey. It's disgusting. Yeah. Yeah. Is that it, in a mere 10 years, you saw the transformation of what had been the most integrally Catholic culture mm-hmm. in North America into the kind of slop uh, that we have in, in the United States. And one of, one of the things I think that Anglo-Canadians never understood is that if a French Canadian loses his language, he doesn't become an Anglo-Canadian. He becomes an American. Yeah. I mean, with the same bad values and, the, and so on. Uh, 
qui perd sa langue, perd sa foi. Unfortunately, what the Revolution Tranquille showed is that you can keep your language and lose your faith. And that's worse. Because yeah, Quebec, it, Quebec is a... I lived in Ottawa for a while. And it was just right there. It's basically a French city. Uh, you, you mean the gateway to Hull, I think. The gateway to hell. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It was, uh, well, you go to the University of Ottawa on the drinking age in Ottawa and Hull is 18. So anyway, people would go across, the, well, literally walk across the bridge to a different place to go out one year early. Um, but in any case, Quebec is, uh, well, I've been to Ireland once and it reminds me a little bit of Ireland insofar as it's a place that has kept almost like it's kept the veneer of its traditions it's kept the uh accoutrement and the aesthetic but there's a great sadness that underpins everything because yes. they've lost their heart yes and um you can't even swear in quebec without using religious terms um That's but correct. they don't but they don't deign the the uh the door of a church and uh They went from having probably Jordan Peterson, that psychologist, right? He's funny. He says Quebec was the strongest Catholic nation on earth. And he means that he's, it was the strongest European Catholic nation left until the 1960s. Um, and perhaps maybe you can, uh, uh, speaking of la noirceur of the darkening, perhaps you could enlighten us a little bit about the myths of, um, um, of, uh, Duplessis, because there's this idea that Quebec was this, uh, you know, oppressive clericalist state, and then everything got better once they introduced sexual immorality and destroying everything. So perhaps you can tell us, in my opinion, Quebec before the so-called Revolution Tranquille, which my professors in university told me was a good thing. Um, perhaps, It, I, in my opinion, it was almost kind of like Salazar's, it was almost like a new France version of, a, of an integralist state, like with Franco or Salazar. It had its issues, but it was preferable to the, the modern democratic garbage. What do you think? Well, you took the words right out of my mouth. Uh, you know, I, I, refer to, uh, I refer to the current time in Quebec <clears throat> as la grande noisseuse. Okay. <laughs> which is a, uh, a term I hope, to, uh, I hope to popularize. TM, TM that. Yeah. The, the grand, uh, the grand it, it imbeciles? The, What is that? It means the great darkness. Okay. Except that it's feminine. Yeah. You see. It's, it's more politically correct that way. Yes. It's so wonderful. OG Willikers. Let's all put on our masks and cower in our homes. Exactly. Let me say this about the supposed oppression of Duplessis. Put on your mask and stay home. Yeah, exactly. We are not in a position to yap about anything. No more. We will take anything. Uh, this is something, gentlemen, that gets me a little annoyed. Uh, when I hear people talk about absolute monarchies, they never existed in the sense that we have an absolute state. <clears throat> yep. uh, Henry VIII had to pretend somehow to play within the law. He couldn't redefine the nature of marriage. Right. He couldn't redefine uh, the nature of humanity. But our lords and masters can. And we have no problem with it. So I guess it's okay because we're free. No, no, I, I understand. I read, I read Brave New World. I get it. Give us all the sex and drugs we can take, and you can do anything you want to us. Yeah, I get it. I understand that. That's wonderful. But the truth of the matter is, is that uh, the, only, the biggest problem with the Duplessis years, the most terrible thing about them, was that they ended. Yeah. And obviously, if things had been perfect in Quebec, you wouldn't have had the scum that came to the surface in the, uh, you wouldn't have had the Trudeaus, you wouldn't have had the Levaques, you wouldn't have had these morons. Or the Castros. No. Well, <laughs> spelled, spelled C-A-S-T-R-E-A-U-X. Exactly. Yeah. But no, the, the, the thing is that the, the, these utter slime that became the Quebec leadership and the Canadian leadership. I mean, yeah. one of the things you've also got to bear in mind is that the quiet revolution, so-called, also did a number on Anglo-Canada. It did. It wasn't just us that got it. Uh, you know, I, I've often said that what people have to do is read George Grant and Lionel Gru side by side. 
They really do. Because Lament for a Nation and, oh, I don't know, anything you like uh, from Gru and Not Made La Passe or anything you like like that. Um, because the two peoples, I mean, and this, this is where, how do I put it, a certain amount of realism is necessary. The Canada that we know or knew was really the result of a compact between two peoples. The French Canadians who were Catholic and the Anglo Canadians who in their beginning were loyalists who had fled the revolution in America. The one thing they had in common was a uh, joint loyalty to the crown. They had nothing else. And they weren't American. That was it. And the, the price of the deal is that they would more or less try to coexist uh, simply because they were stronger together against their southern neighbor than they could possibly have existed separately. When, uh, when that was lost sight of, when the French ceased to be French and the Anglos ceased to be Anglo, Canada ceased to be Canada. Yep. And that, uh, and <laughs> I mean, there's just no way around that. I mean, for all of their resentment for each of each other, they play. They both of them played a part. Yep. They ceased to, and so the whole thing has gone to pieces. Um, that's why I say you should read Gru and uh, and uh, Grant in tandem, because he'll give you a very good picture of how the Anglo Canadians declined. Yeah, it's true. Yeah, that, up until up until the late 1960s, coming into Canada. Well, they still saying God save the Queen, but. When you would be an immigrant woman, didn't matter where you were from, um, there was a huge influx of immigrants into Canada from places like anywhere where there was an English colony. So there was always yeah. sort of this racial diversity anyway, just because, you know, the sun never set on the British Empire. So you'd have, you'd have West Indians and you'd have East Indians and so on and so forth. Lots of Africans. And um, but you would learn that there was this society. I can't remember what it was called. It's something kind of like the Daughters of the American Revolution. Just all oh, the uh, the uh, I know what they were. The Daughters of the British Empire. I think the Imperial, the, the Imperial Order. No, the Imperial Order of the Daughters of the Empire. That's what it is. And yeah. but they would literally you'd become an English. You were you would come to Canada as an immigrant, and you would be taught things like how to have afternoon tea. But it wasn't like patronizing. It was. You know, I, it's funny, I have, I had students from, you know, Columbia and other places, and these were young ladies, and, and they would say to me, why don't they do that anymore? I want that. Like, I came to Canada because it's Canada. We left a place, I mean, I miss my country, but, but they said, isn't that so nice that they would actually teach us stuff about what they do here, rather than say, teach us what you do? She said, it's kind of lame because... Um, Universities are a strength, Kennedy, come on. Well, it's, it's just, I mean, yeah, the program much. here. She's not in Colombia anymore. She, she said, I, I explained it. It's so beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and, but that, that's, yeah, uh, well. that's something that brings up the um, interesting point, which you bring out in your book, Mr. Kloom, is <clears> the, <throat> the stipulation in the Declaration of Independence by Jefferson that's against Quebec. That's yes. against the, uh, the Quebec Act. Uh, there's a veiled reference to Catholicism as a, as a, <laughs> in the Declaration of Independence. Um, yes. And I wanted to uh, ask you about the Metis, uh, but and I, I just found this quote from your book while you were talking about the faith, and that's from uh, Samuel de, de Champlain, de Champlain right. where he says that he's the one, he's the founder of Quebec City. He's the one who says this, quote, I have always desired to see the lily symbol of France flourish together with the <clears throat> only religion, Catholic, Apostolic, and Roman. Oh. And so he sees himself as very much the, spreader of the faith now you you mentioned though that when when the french come there's an existing war between the indian tribes correct between the five nations of the iroquois mohawk cayuga oneida anondaga and seneca mm -hmm. versus the huron and the algonquin and the french ally with the latter huron and the algonquin whereas the five nations ally much more with the english and the dutch oh. but you also mentioned as you did the the strong conversions to catholicism among the hurons there's the huron carol famously by saint john de Beauf. um the abnaki the algonquins the illinois the ottawa and others and one of the interesting th contrasts that i see between when we look at spanish french and english colonies 
is that the English never really develop a mixed race culture with the with the uh, Indians in their area, whereas the no. obviously the Spanish are mestizos all over. And then we in the front in New France, we have the Métis. Yeah. So can you tell us about the Métis, the history of this mixed race culture and its influence on New Spain? Well, sure. I, I'm New France, I, I think you mean. Oh, yes. Uh, I, I, I don't know how much the Métis uh, in the north influenced New Spain. Probably not much, but it's OK. Uh, although actually that's not entirely true, and I'll explain why in a moment. But basically, I mentioned earlier the uh, voyageurs, the coureurs du bois, who were constantly expanding the frontiers of New France westward and into the interior. And they'd set up trading posts and all that. But they didn't bring women with them. So they married Indians. And mind you, there was a certain amount of this in Quebec as well. And I think most of us probably have some Indian blood. You wouldn't notice it in me, but you would in my Coulomb cousins. Not my adult cousins. I look like them. But uh, my Coulomb cousins all have very, very high cheekbones and dark complected and all that. But uh, I mean, it's one of the interesting things about uh, French Canadian ethnicity is that in one family, you can have kids, you know, one's blonde, the other's olive. And, but the, the features are the same. You, you, you can see they've got the same parents. It's anyway. So the, uh, their children, the Métis, were generally French speaking, and they ended up pioneering all the way to the Pacific Ocean. And so when you had the rise of the great English fur companies, the Northwest Company, the Hudson's Bay Company, uh, and some of the others, they used Métis for everything. They were trappers. They were uh, soldiers, police, in a sense. Um, the Hudson's Bay Company absorbed all of its, uh, all of its rivals and ended up uh, pretty much running what's now Western Canada, and the American uh, states of Washington, Oregon, uh, Montana, Idaho, that was all the, the uh, Rupert's land, the, uh, the land of the Hudson's Bay Company. And you, know, you see these posts all run by Metis with uh, maybe a Scots or an English factor in charge. And the, uh, the red ensign, the, the red flag with the um, Union Jack in the uh, Canton, but the white, the, the letters in white, HBC, yeah. Hudson's Bay Company, which uh, people would say very jokingly meant here before Christ. <laughs> but uh, interestingly enough, though, the Hudson's Bay Company and the Metis also opened up the Canadian West to missionary work. So amongst other orders, the best known was the Oblates of Mary Immaculate. Um, and then later on, they would be seconded by what became the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. The settling of the Canadian West was an, um, an epic. Again, we never hear about down south, but it was an amazing story. The Métis were key to all of that because they were inevitably the very first European settlers in any given area. I say European because they were more or less at home in both cultures. They might dress like Indians. They could speak Indian languages. Uh, they had the Indian skills, but they spoke French. They were Catholic, usually. There were some of them were Scots, but they were mostly French Catholic. And they were the initial settlers of places like Manitoba, uh, British Columbia, Montana, Washington, Oregon. These places are North Dakota. These places still have Métis populations to this day. Uh, Later, as uh, white settlers came from Eastern Canada, uh, they would come into a lot of conflict with the existing Métis. And yep. the result of that were the two great Métis rebellions under Louis Riel. Uh, the first in Manitoba, the second in Saskatchewan, because they, a lot of them moved west. From the uh, Manitoba rising was 1871, they were pardoned, moved west. They had to have an, they had another revolt that was put down, and Riel was hung. But Louis Riel was a, a very interesting character, a very devout Catholic, 
although he rebelled against the government in Ottawa, he was actually very loyal to the Queen, which is something people don't know. And in fact, in between the two rebellions, he led a group of Metis in repelling a Fenian raid from the United States. Because, as I say, he was loyal to the descendant of George III who gave us the Quebec Act. But he didn't have much use for uh, Ottawa. However, having said that, he was also a little crazy. And at one point, for a while, at one point thought he was the younger brother of Christ. Uh, that turned out not to be true, actually. <laughs> he was an eccentric man. He, he had his issues. But nevertheless, he is the great hero of the Metis today. Mm -hmm. And it speaks volumes, I think, of the, the essential correctness of the, uh, of the uh, French manner of settlement that the Metis were such standard bearers of French civilization. My wife is one sixteenth Métis, ah, so her uh, her grandmother would be one quarter. Um, and there's there's a, you get your there's a status card they call in Canada where if you're a certain blood amount, like in your bloodlines of native of some sort, then you can get a tax thing. I mean, we don't qualify, but so I wanted to ask you, Charles, um, when I think of Quebec, now I'm a Montreal Canadiens fan, I'm a Habs fan. So for people who don't know hockey, the the Canadian Montreal Canadiens logo, it's got a C and an H in the middle. The H does not stand for Habs. It stands for Club de Hockey, but people think it stands for Habs. So if, if you hear a Canadian talking about their favorite hockey team, they'll say, I'm a Habs fan. That means the Montreal Canadiens, because they call them les habitants d'hockey, the, the, the pioneers of hockey. Um, most people think of French Canadians in Canada as hockey players, but not just from a, not just from a stereotypical stance, but Maurice Richard, who was a child hero of mine, and he was actually friends with Duplessis, and he himself was a faithful Catholic, six kids. Um, he was the first civilian when he died. For Americans that don't know, he was sort of like um, like Jackie Robinson. I mean, Quebec obviously is not a different race in the classic sense, but the culture itself was very distinct and separate. So one of the ways you could transgress these lines of separation and inferiority between the English and the Canadians is through hockey because it was an equalizer on the ice. You know, you could beat Toronto. If you couldn't beat them politically, you could beat them in hockey over and over again. And Maurice Richard was uh, the first great French superstar. And people don't know how big hockey was in Quebec. And it's, you can't talk about Quebec without talking about hockey because as I said, it really was the equalizer culturally. And there was a team called the Montreal Millionaires as early as the 1920s. And they actually made a million dollars at that time to play hockey, which inflation today, they've made 20 million, it'd be like 15, 20 million dollars a year. It was such big money. And Montreal was the uh, economic center of Canada at that time. Anyway, oh. so is hockey important amongst the French Canadian diaspora as it is amongst the French Canadians that are still here? Well, that's a, a good question. It certainly was. I don't know that it is. Okay. Uh, the, uh, the diaspora, we have become really deraciné. You know, okay. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you something, uh, something uh, embarrassing, but true. I had not dreamt in French since I was a teenager. Okay. But a very funny thing has happened here in Austria. I have to speak German here a lot. My German isn't great, but I get along. Three months ago, for the first time since I was maybe 15, I dreamt in French. Hmm. <clears throat> and it hasn't happened since. It's very odd. Very, very odd. And the only thing I can figure is that uh, having to constantly root around with the German is loosening the hold of the English on me. <laughs> but the truth is that uh, the story of the, of the French Canadian diaspora in America is very tragic. If Well, I mean, if you think uh, holding on to your faith and uh, culture is an important thing. If you don't, then it doesn't matter. Then it's great. It's a story of complete assimilation. Okay. Uh, and it's not complete. I mean, you still find French-speaking areas in Maine. But as I mentioned, um, Little Rose Ferrand in Woonsocket, Rhode Island, uh, 
the little Canadas, as they were called, that produced people like my dad, like Jack Kerouac, um, Jean-Louis de Cadillac. Um, in fact, his story is a, a brilliant and sad parable of the decline and fall of uh, French New England. Uh, he was perfectly bilingual, but had to somehow juggle between the inherent values of our faith and our culture with the values of the mainstream. Well, where do you fit in with that? What, which is true and which is not. And you see, it's not like in Canada where there is French Canada and there's Anglo-Canada and you negotiate between these two realities. With us, you're one minority amongst many others. Right. And you, you know, when we came to Los Angeles when I was six, I mean, French Canadian, what's that? Right. You're an Anglo or you're Hispanic. Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually neither one. No, no, you got to be one or the other. No, no, I don't. But that, uh, and of course, as, as, you know, the Los Angeles is the third largest number of French Canadians in the country. Really? Eh? Wow. Yeah. And as late as the 70s, uh, in fact, 35 years ago, uh, this New Year's Eve, I, uh, I went to a big French Canadian uh, New Year's Eve party with my dad. For the Chevalier de Colombe, we had a, a French Canadian council in Los Angeles. Knights of Colombe, that, there you go. <laughs> but that's all gone, you see. So it's a it's a very a very sad story. Part of it, I mean, there are a lot of reasons for it. You know, the United States has a culture that does require assimilation if you're going to compete in it, and there's no way around that. So people like uh, Gru and Tadivel and all that who uh, preached against our coming south, they didn't know what they were talking about. It took longer than it did with a lot of other people, but it happened. It happened in my dad's lifetime. You know, um, we had a network of French schools in New England where you learned half the day in English, half the day in French. Mm -hmm. And it produced people who were perfectly bilingual and devout Catholics. Well, what's become of that? C'est tout. Or gone. Fini. Is there a, a book or an author you'd recommend for learning about Duplessis? Um, because I, I think, to be honest, because we live in, well, I mean, the American political system is different, but representative government nonetheless. Um, I think he's an interesting person that we could study as North Americans on how a Catholic worked in the sort of North American Anglo sphere. Can you, yeah. can you, just for the viewers too, can you, can you tell us about Duplessis? Who is that? Right. And why is um, that era? Why is it called that era? Uh, no, I, I refuse. <laughs> no, all right, I'll tell you. I don't. I don't mind. I'm open. Uh, basically, uh, Duplessis. Uh, Duplessis was from Trois Rivières in uh, Quebec. Uh, he was the leader in the 1920s, starting of the uh, Quebec Conservative Party. Now, this requires a certain amount of explanation. Not unlike Canada itself, the Conservative Party originally was a sort of coalition between specifically French Canadian conservatives. What does this mean? They're in favor of the church, they're uh, of, of the church's role in, in life, they're um, in favor of a social economy, they're um, not pro American. That was, uh, they were allied with the Anglo conservatives. Now, what were they? Well, they were often Anglican. They were very uh, high Anglican. Uh, they were very much tied to the British connection. Very, um, very conscious of being part of the empire. Again, again, for that reason, not pro-American and also in favor of a social economy. Uh, <laughs> the opponents of both, the grits, as they call them, the liberals, uh, very pro-American in terms of wanting to weaken the connection with, uh, with Britain um, and assimilate as much as possible to the great southern neighbor. A, uh, a good example of that was the, uh, of that sort of individual was the prime minister during World War II, a man named William Lyons Mackenzie King, who was also a spiritualist and got a great deal of advice from beyond. 
from his dead dog. He would speak to his dead dog. It was taxidermy. Well, mm. somebody had to. Yeah. Yeah. If not he, then <laughs> whom? I think he was a Mason too. But well, he had issues, you know. Okay. Uh, but uh, he was really the architect of the um, of the descent of Canada to what it's become. If one, if you wanted to point to a single person, you know, and that's always a bit invidious because it's never just one guy. But still, that's who you choose it. It's funny how a guy who talks to demons would make the downfall of a country. It's weird how that works. We don't call them demons anymore. They're separated angels. <laughs> anyway. So, obviously, someone hasn't been, uh, been reading the latest. Sorry. But sorry. The, uh, so, the, the thing is, though, that uh, <laughs> as I say, uh, took over the, uh, the Conservative Party in Quebec and retooled it into what was called the Union Nationale. Now, he was, as you earlier indicated, uh, Kennedy, quite correctly, uh, he was very much inspired. Remember this, that this is the golden age of Catholic social teaching, in a sense. So he was inspired by people like Salazar, by Dolphus, and so on, and also by Charles Maurras. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, uh, I mentioned earlier Monsignor Lionel Grou, who was our great uh, historian, but he was also the founder of something called L'Action Française Canadienne. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, this was very much in the air in the 30s. And he created a regime that had to do two things at once, which were very difficult. One was to safeguard the essential nature of the French-Canadian ethos, religiously, culturally, etc. But the other was to somehow compete economically in the modern world. And the third was to preserve the province from um, what was going on in America and the rest of Canada in terms of socialism and uh, communism and all kinds of good stuff. Well, this is a difficult game to play. That's a hard job. Yeah, it really was. Um, the closest equivalent in Anglo terms I could come to is Diefenbaker. Because a little bit later, they, they were codominious for a short while, and, they, and God knows they didn't get on too well. But nevertheless, Diefenbaker played a very similar role in terms of anglo canadian and is ultimately an unsuccessful one. Um, they call it the Grand Roisseur, the Great Darkness, because they're idiots. Uh, sorry, <laughs> Oh, you're I correct. Mean, That's the right term. Idiot. 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 Vraiment. Idiot. That's it's uh, they're 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 utter fools. I mean, at, at its most basic basic level, let me make something very very clear. The French Canadians are a minority people in a continent that is primarily anglophone. The only way we were able to maintain ourselves was with a huge birth rate. Yeah, huge. It was huge. It was huge. Yeah. They call it the Revanche de Vaisseau, uh, <laughs> the Revenge of the Cradle. Yeah. Um, and that, that was what maintained us. So in the, during the Quiet Revolution, a, a group of morons take over who push abortion and birth control. Now, now forget the ethical elements for a moment. Although murder and, and race suicide probably aren't good things in and of themselves, but put that aside. You're a minority people. You've only survived because there are always going to be a certain number of you who are assimilated away. Yeah. The only way you can keep going is to have a big birth rate. Yeah. There's no other way around that. It's below replacement rate now. It's 1.2. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's called suicide, and which is why I can't bear to hear modern Quebecois nationalists. I can't stand I it. It's a schizophrenic movement. It's, well, it's like Irish nationalism. Yeah. You know, uh, my, my, my favorite example of this was during when Parliament was paralyzed during the great Brexit debate, you know, in Westminster. They did somehow manage, I don't know, to pull together enough unity to force uh, abortion on a Northern Ireland. Yes. Who signs off on that but bloody Sinn Féin? Yeah. Oh, Irish nationalism, a nation once again. Oh, shut up. Yeah. You know what? Just take pistols, put them to your temple, and pull the trigger. Well, the word nation means to be born. That's the ironic part. Nash it. No. It's like literally to no. birth. So, and yeah, it's so stupid. 
The, well, you see, as we sit here in our COVID-induced uh, curfews and masks. Our freedom, our freedom. Uh, freedom. Freedom to slow the curve. Freedom to be stupid. Two weeks. Uh, I, I just... Calm down. Calm down. <laughs> you, you're going to... Gonna, the, uh, a good book about C, right? It was, ah, uh... Well, the answer is I can't. Okay. What I can recommend, and this is going to sound sort of strange, but there is a, shall we say, interesting group in uh, France and Canada called the uh, Counter Reformation in the 21st Century. It was sounds founded. Like kind of, sounds like my kind of movement. <laughs> well, they're, they're, they're an interesting bunch. I mean, I can't say that they know all and, and, and be all, but they, they put out some very interesting things and useful things. They were founded by a, a French priest by the name of the Abbe de Nantes. Okay. Um, and they have a, a very interesting website with all sorts of stuff on Canadian history. <laughs> and they include a very intense uh, biography of Duplessis. Okay. And I can recommend it highly. Now, the other thing I, I should mention about Duplessis, uh, in Canada, for those who aren't aware, while the Queen is the Queen of Canada and of each of the provinces separately, she obviously doesn't live in Ottawa or in Toronto or Winnipeg or Quebec City. So uh, she is represented in those places by a Governor General in, uh, in Quebec. Uh, sorry, <laughs> I wish. Governor General in, uh, in uh, Ottawa. Ottawa, same thing. And each, yeah, and in each of, in each of the uh, provincial capitals by a Lieutenant Governor uh, who do what she would do if she lived there, opens Parliament. Does Which is all nothing. Stuff. <laughs> oh no, they they do quite a bit. But I'm just mean, joking. I know. I just symbol. Well, it, it's there's an important point here. Uh, they carry out a certain amount of pomp and so forth. And it's a reminder that the country is not a republic. Um, they used to be a lot better at it before the Quiet Revolution, but that's one of the things that's also gotten yeah. down the tubes. Yeah. Well, the thing is that the Governor General is appointed on the advice of the uh, prime minister, which is one of the major defects in my humble opinion of the system. Uh, because the governor general is supposed to be a counterweight, uh, a check on the government. But if he's appointed yeah. by the advice of the government, it does happen. I'm a famous case in Australia when uh, uh, the governor general then, when the prime minister was going to govern extra constitutionally, the governor general who'd been appointed at his request threw him out. Yeah. The prime minister, was, the prime minister appointing the governor general in today is kind of like the mob appointing the consigliere to be the governor, governor general. It's, exactly. It's, <laughs> it's, and it becomes a retirement home for retired politicians, you know? Yes. Yeah. But at any rate, uh, I mention this because uh, under Duplessis, a lieutenant governor was appointed uh, at his advice by the name of Paul Comtois, a very important individual. Because in 1966, <clears throat> uh, Bois de Coulanges government house in uh, Quebec, just outside in, uh, in uh, well, Bois de Coulanges, it's, uh, it's, what is, I can't think of the name of the, of the place. It's Sillery. That's right. It's just, a, it's a part now because the place was never rebuilt. But in 1966, it burned down. And uh, the lieutenant governor, Paul Comtois, he got his, uh, his family and the guests and the servants out of the place. And then he went back to rescue the Blessed Sacrament from the uh, chapel. He managed to rescue the Blessed Sacrament, but he died in so doing. Mm. And they found his body. He was a big, bulky guy. He put the picks under him. Oh, my goodness. He was, he was trapped, you see, in the burning house. He couldn't get out. So he put the picks under him and pulled himself around it. And when they found him, the flames had burned his back. They'd sheared his, his arms off. You know, they were separated from the body. But the picks was untouched. Hmm. He had succeeded. And that was in 1966. Wow. And I, I've, always, I've always thought of the death of Paul Comtois as being, in a real sense, symbolic of the death of, of Quebec. Quebec. Yeah. Mm. 
Wow. He, uh, but he was appointed at the request of uh, Duplessis, which shows you something. The other thing is that the governor general at that time is up for canonization. Vanier, Georges Vanier. Oh, right. Uh, who was a very, uh, very devout man, uh, very assertive as a governor general. The, uh, it was interesting because uh, when they got rid of curtsying to the Queen of the Netherlands, uh, he was asked, will we get rid of curtsying to the, and bowing to the governor general? You know, and he said, well, you have to understand I represent the Queen of Canada, not the Queen of the Netherlands. <laughs> and... <laughs> One of, one of the things, for those who are not familiar with the French Canadians, will find that there's often quite a, a bit of zip and zing to their comments. I, I, it could be that I'm biased, but uh, there is kind of a snap to French Canadian discourse that you don't really oh, find. Yeah. There's a myth, too, that the French, I mean, maybe it's different in France, but well, I don't think so. But um, I played football against all the, the teams from Montreal. I played in Ottawa, so we were, the Inter-University League was, anyway. And uh, they're the toughest SOBs on the planet. You don't become a nation of people known for hockey. And they're actually the, weirdly the best football players in Canada, generally speaking. And in France, one of their main sports is rugby. Like they're a tough people. And um, this, I think it's probably the Americanist sort of myth. Yeah, it's, it's the American. <laughs> but like historically, they're like the toughest. They're as tough as anybody. It's crazy. Well, I, I mean, again, You've got a very difficult terrain in which, we, as a people, we were born. Yeah, uh, we were fighting from the minute we started. Uh, you know, against the Iroquois, against the English, then against the Americans. Uh, people forget that Quebec was occupied during the Revolution uh, by the by the Americans, uh, and it's kind of an interesting story there. I don't mind telling. Uh, initially, the Continental Congress. Although they condemned the Quebec Act, which gave us our freedom, religion, and laws, and is really the basis of uh, the basis of our loyalty to the Canadian project, such as it was, um, it was condemned in the Declaration of Independence. But the Continental Congress sent two letters: one to the people of Canada, one to the people of Great Britain. One of the people of Canada said, surely, although we are different in religion, we are united by the same love of liberty, blah, 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 blah. The one of the people of Britain attacked the king for having established in Quebec that religion which has bathed your islands in blood. Now, unfortunately for the Continental Congress, Bishop Briand of Quebec got copies of both letters. So this was kind of an oops moment for the Continental Congress. Well, it was decided that they would send uh, Father John Carroll, who was the best known American priest at the time, and Benjamin Franklin north to attempt to seduce the French Canadians to the rebellion. Well, Bishop Briand, having seen the letters, knew what the whole story was. So he forbade any of his priests to put them up suspended the single one who did and excommunicated John Carroll. From his diocese. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's why when many, many years later, Carroll would be appointed Bishop of Baltimore. He had to go to England to be consecrated mm -hmm. because he couldn't go to Quebec. He couldn't set foot in the diocese. Yeah. I mean, think about it. Quebec was a lot closer to Baltimore than of course. England. It's three month, two and a half month journey the other way. Otherwise, you could go up a you know a few days. You know, it was a big figure in Quebec before the Quai Revolution, um, Archbishop Marcel Lefebvre. You can actually yes. you can read. It's funny. So as Europe was descending into libertinism or whatever, Quebec was resisting a lot because of the sort of conservative aspect of Duplessis, etc. So I remember reading like after the Council, Lefebvre goes to Canada. And he writes an op-ed in Le Devoir, which is the sort of major newspaper in Montreal. Today, it's a rag. It's, 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 it's you know, it's the, it's the Washington Post style. It's just a rag. Um, but at that, so you can look in the archives of Le Devoir and you can find a letter by Marcel Lefebvre going against the errors of modernism after the council in a Quebec newspaper. It's just an astonishing contradiction to how far the mighty have fallen. Well, yeah, and they, they fell 
Well, how do I say this? You know, we, we just, just two days ago, Father Yves Normandin died. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the pastor out in the cold, as he was called. Uh, but the reason I think why Quebec fell so quickly is the same reason Ireland did, and the same reason that the Dutch in the, the Dutch Catholics in the Netherlands did, um, and, and certain other places. And that is that these were cultures that were very, very clerical. Uh, for various reasons, they didn't really have a traditional lay leadership. I mean, Duplessis came out of nowhere, really. Um, the, the, with the abolition of the seigneuries, we didn't have a native aristocracy anymore. Yeah. We didn't really... So the, cl the clergy were the closest thing to it. And when they lost their... Fathers. When they lost their faith, yeah. when they became whatever it is they are, uh, the whole thing collapsed. And, and you know, it's interesting. Back in uh, 1992, I did a national lecture tour of Ireland. And my topic was the future of the church in Ireland. And I made a lot of predictions as to what were going to happen in the next 10 years. And they all came true. And of course, people were upset with me. You know, they, they didn't like what I had to say. But uh, the fellow, the kid, as he was then, who was my sound man on the tour, I still know him, he's a, still a very good friend of mine. Um, but he asked me, there, how did you know? I said, well, I'm not a prophet. It wasn't the tarot cards. Uh, it It's just that I've seen this with the quiet revolution. You know, I've seen this script before. I know exactly how it's going to work for you guys because it worked that way for us. You will turn into utter slime. Corruptio optima <laughs> pessima. <laughs> no, I'm French Canadian, remember. <laughs> Corruptio <laughs> yes. optima pessima. We have become slime. You know, this piece of work that's the premier now taking the crucifix uh, out of the Assemblée Lego. Nationale. Lego. Lego. Uh, uh, utter slime, utter slime. And, uh, you know, the, the, the truth is that there are the, the signs of hope on the horizon is that there do seem to be more and more young people who are beginning to realize that there's this huge gap. You know, there's a huge, do you know, Alexis Coisette? He's uh, he had a show called Radio Quebec no. and he was kicked off of terrestrial radio. And he went to YouTube and Periscope and whatever. Now he's like the most popular. He's one of the most popular um, Quebec, uh, French speaking radio personalities like in the world now. Yeah. Um, so but he's conservative. I mean, he's a little bit into QAnon. He kind of goes off the deep end on certain things. But nonetheless, he is French Canadian. He is French Canadian. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Quebec is uh, well, Quebec is French and the French are crazy. Pardon, pardon that, uh, Charles. But Merci. what I mean is, is you know, in, in France, you have this dichotomy of, you know, you have, what's their, Macron, you have this demon socialist who's their leader, but then you also have this really strong ethnic nationalist movement that's almost as strong. And the same thing in Quebec, you have right now, well, Ontario probably has stricter lockdown measures. I live in the U.S. I live in the People's Republic of Toronto right now. That's what I call Ontario. And, um, but in Quebec, you have the most severe anti-establishment, anti-communist sentiment and a huge conservative uprising right now amongst young people. And they're discovering, and actually they've latched on to Archbishop Vigano a lot. They're discovering the fact, they're just kind of reading history and they're going, life kind of sucks now. And yeah. it used to not. And we used to be way more French. And yeah. as they try to discover that, almost from a, a perspective of toleration of, well, I mean, we were Catholic. So, I mean, there's gotta be something to that. So there is actually, you know, a friend of mine is the district superior for the SSPX and uh, he's, he's our former pastor and he's in Quebec at the district house and Quebec weirdly has really strict measures, but at the same time, they don't enforce them in the same way. Whereas in other places in Canada, we have this sort of Anglican via media personality where we'll do whatever the government says and they don't do too and it's just weird um so quebec weirdly has it's primed that sort of nationalist spirit is still there and with a little spark um i could see it going completely the other way because that's how they operate well yeah i mean my dad always said that uh when we're good we're extraordinary and when we're bad we're hideous uh, extraordinary at both yeah yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, there are no, you see, 
the French Canadians, not unlike the French, and really <laughs> think about it, not unlike most Catholic peoples. Yes. Uh, we do. We are not people of moderation. No. And uh, one of one of my my grandfather, my mother's father, was Austrian, and he um, he used to say you can get nothing done in Catholic countries because no one will compromise. Yeah. You can get nothing done in Protestant countries because everyone will compromise. Yeah. And that there's a certain amount of truth to that. I think. That's it. That's exactly it. Uh, but I, I mean, you know, it, it, if Quebec is to survive, I mean, basically there are only two ways that not just Quebec, but French North America. And I, I, you know, include my own people in Louisiana with that. The only way we can survive is to rediscover who we are Mm -hmm. and to try to live accordingly. Duplessis has to be seen as a hero. There are no two ways around it. Uh, we have to know about him. We have to know about people like Paul Comtois and uh, Georges Vanier. We we need to know about uh, uh, Jules-Paul uh, Tarivel. Well, the um, this is a little piece. Canada has so much Catholic stuff no one knows about. The um, university football. We actually have the oldest university foot. Canada had the f- has the oldest professional football league, and we have the oldest university football teams. Weirdly enough. Um, I won't go too much on a tangent here, but in America, in most states, rugby was actually the national sport until football became nationalized or professionalized. That's it. So, but um, in Canada, we have this old tradition of football and the Vanier cup is our national. It's like our NCAA championship football right. trophy. The biggest thing, you know, like big for, I mean, 30,000 people in the stands, national TV. So whenever the university wins the Canadian university football championship, they win a trophy named after a man who's in the canonization process. That's well, just that's, pretty interesting. That's a good deal. You know, one of the things that I always find interesting about Canada <clears throat> is that you know, if you go to the Maritimes, you go to Ontario, certainly if you go to Quebec, and you're an American, you know you're not in the United States. You're in a foreign country. There's yeah. no, no doubt about it. But Western Canada feels very American. Yeah. Except that there are crowns all over the place and the royal this and the royal that. And it's, it's like this weird alternate world where the American revolution didn't take place. <laughs> but other, I, I mean, it's, 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 it's quite something to, to see. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, he, he, even the settling of the American of the Canadian West versus the settling of the American West, uh, totally different. Yep. The, from the treatment of the Indians to, I mean, you guys, because of the Mounties, you guys didn't have a Wild West. Mm-hmm. You, you, you just didn't. Uh, and there was a movie that came out, gosh, maybe 30 or 40 years ago now, called uh, Please Don't Shoot the Teacher. Okay. Which uh, <laughs> was set in the rural Saskatchewan during the Depression. <laughs> There's a place you'd want to be, right? The Dust Bowl. Exactly. Yeah. And the, uh, I, I forget the plot. I saw it on the plane flying between uh, L.A. and London, and I, I don't remember the plot very well. I do remember the star of it was the guy who was in Harold and Maude, so you can look it up. But he's a teacher. And I remember he's got the Union Jack behind him on the, uh, on the, uh, in the schoolroom. And it just, it, it's funny. A little outpost of empire in the middle of nowhere. You know, yeah. uh, whereas, of course, in Quebec, the only the only really uh, Anglo areas were Montreal, you know, the, the uh, St. James and places like that, and uh, the Eastern Townships. Because well, no, was... no. There are English-speaking separatists in Quebec. Oh, yeah. Because Montreal was the financial capital of Canada before the 1960s. Because, well, for one, it was bigger and better and just historically and the French were there before the English and, you know, better, closer to New York and all that kind of stuff. Um, But it wasn't until French committed national economic, or Quebec committed national economic suicide by imposing things like language laws, etc. Because in Quebec, they're legitimately, this is what the socialists do. They'll find something that's legitimately kind of a grievance and then they turn it in. It's like a heresy. They take one truth and they blow it yeah. over all the rest. And they ride, they ride it. Exactly. So, but 
there was a little, there was this element of, I mean, if you wanted to play the game nationally in Canada, you did have to be an English speaker or at least spoke English. You didn't have to be an Eng Anglophone. So yeah. of course, in these major com companies that were providing a lot of the jobs in Quebec, they were run by English speaking Canadians a lot of the time who themselves might've had their prejudice. And that's just part of history. So in order to combat that, I mean, today you could open a Chinese restaurant in Quebec and you have to have a French sign over the Chinese. That's, that's just how it goes. You can't, you in, in Quebec to have a school, you can't get government funding if you don't have at least like 10% French spoken or whatever. It's a, so, but they committed economic suicide because all these English businessmen were like, well, I'm not going to stay here. So they moved to Toronto and now Toronto is, you know, Bay street is wall street. Um, but that was, that was how they did that there. And see that, that in a sense really ruined Toronto. Yes. Which, uh, you know, my my mother always told the story of going to Toronto in the 40s. And uh, in those days, it was really run uh, socially by the blue stockings. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, very cultured ladies. Who say, it was oh, an English oh, town. Very much so. Yeah. And that and it, it lost that character. There's a you, you're familiar with Rupert Brooke, mm -hmm. the uh, English poet. Well, he visited Toronto for like six months before World War One. He took rooms on Lower Java Street, which was then as now was kind of Skid Row. So he's at this tea because he was already well known as a literateur. Mm -hmm. And so there's this tea, you see, and one of the blue stocking ladies comes up to him and says, uh, Mr. Brooke, where are you staying in Toronto? He says, well, I've, I've got rooms on Lower Java Street. He says, oh, Lower Java Street. My dear Mr. Brooke, Lower Java Street is not a fashionable address. Yeah, this response yeah. was, Madam Toronto is not a, is not a fashionable address, right? <laughs> yeah, that's pretty. Yeah, that's that's funny. It uh, we uh, maybe I'll find you a picture and, and we can put it up somehow, Tim. But um, you want? We, yeah, we did a uh, march. Well, not a march. We did a rosary. I hate calling them marches because it sounds like you're doing a protest. Yeah, a procession. We did a procession. Yeah, um, but uh, with the Fatima, I'm with the Fatima Center, and the beautiful backdrop of Toronto's Parliament Hill, Queen's Park, Queen's Park, uh, funny enough. Yeah. It is one of the most beautiful buildings that still exists. Um, it is it is an old English building. It's an old monarchical looking thing. And we have a beautiful statue. We have that pilgrim statue. I don't know if I can find it here. Um, it's in the latest Crusader. Send it to made. me. We'll, we'll add it up or we'll put it on the video okay, when I edit it. it. Yeah. And um, it is... Uh, it's a picture of the Blessed Mother and that beautiful Pilgrim Virgin statue. And we're processing it in front of the backdrop of the kingdom looking building of, of Queens Park. And it's such a dichotomy of the beauty and the uh, faith that's on the outside of the building. And people in the picture might not know the rot and the stench on the inside of the building. No, <laughs> but, um, but it is a beautiful image of what Canada could be. It, it is. And I'll, I'll tell you, I have a, uh... I had a very interesting experience in Toronto uh, five, six years ago. It was, so you know uh, the Church of the Blessed Sacrament? I'm not familiar with it. No, it's it's on Young Street. Um, okay. But not downtown. It's it's a bit north of downtown. South of York Mills, north of downtown. Anyway, it's a uh, fairly conservative parish, as conservative parishes go. Uh okay. Uh, well, you know, the name is kind of uh, it kind of forces them into the real presence. They don't have a choice. Right. But uh, the, the pastor there is a pretty orthodox fellow. But uh, the then lieutenant governor, uh, whose name escapes me, uh, gosh, I can't think of it. He's the fellow in the wheelchair. I can't uh, Well, anyway, he made the first official visit to uh, Blessed Sacrament, to a Catholic parish that any lieutenant governor of Ontario had ever made hmm. to a Catholic parish. So they had a, uh, they had a concert uh, at the church and very meticulously took out the Blessed Sacrament and left the tabernacle door open, which is what you should do. You ever go to a Catholic church, they have a concert and the tabernacle isn't <laughs> open, there's a problem. Anyhow, uh, it was a concert by the Governor General's Horse Guards. And it was 
Well, I, I was asked to play ADC to the uh, governor, to the lieutenant governor, uh, you know, show him around and explain everything. And all during the uh, during the concert, his lady asked me different questions about the statues, whatever they make, because they're evangelical. They they didn't know anything about Catholicism. What was interesting it was that at one point of the concert, it was a concert of military music. They played the the uh, marches of the different regiments, and you were asked to stand if you had a familial regiment, you know, familial connection with that regiment whose uh, whose uh, march was being played. So I stood when they played the one for the Vander, okay. which uh, made me very happy. And, you know, his honor looked up at me like, I said, well, what do you want? So it was, it was interesting for me, though, because, you know, they, they blew the, when we, when we came down the aisle, the, the trumpeters blew the trumpet for the vice regal representative and all that. And it struck me as a, kind of a representation of what might have been or what may be. You know, the uh, uh, the truth of the matter is that the British in general and the Anglo-Canadians as a result have inherited a desiccated remnant of a Catholic system. They maintained a lot of the form and the substance has gone. With us, the, uh, the form is gone and so is the substance. The trick is to make these bones live. That's the trick. I don't know how you do that, but uh, it's something that needs to be done. I mean, one of the one of the reasons why the the French Canadians in 1968 in Quebec, you as you may or may not know, there's there's a sort of parliamentary liturgy around both your uh, your uh, Dominion Parliament and the different provincial parliaments with speeches from the throne and, yeah. and all that. Well, in Quebec, they did away with all that in 68. And there's a reason for it. It's the same reason why they had to take the crucifix out, ultimately. <clears throat> the Anglo can live with a, with a form that's been deprived of meaning. But the Catholic mind can't. They're absolutists. Yeah. yeah. It's even when they're socialists and communists and scum. And so the great irony is that, in a sense, Quebec getting rid of all of that showed more respect for it than its maintenance in places like Ontario and Saskatchewan. It's, it's, a, it's a tremendous irony, a sad irony. Uh, the removal of the crucifix... I, as I say, when, when Legault had promised he wouldn't, is one of the things he mentioned in his campaign. Nevertheless, it's appropriate. Because think of all the horrible, evil things that legislature, that Assemblée, have passed. Pretty bad. Yeah. And I... I but it, it, it made me giggle uncontrollably when I was reading a history of the Quebec Parliament, and they referred to all the Anglo-style procedures as the liturgie parlementaire. Yeah, exactly. Only a French-Canadian would have the guts to say it that way. Mm -hmm. You know, some things we still can be proud of, and one of them is that unless we're completely brain dead, we do call a spade a spade, however uncomfortable it may be. Well, there is, there is hope for the future, Charles. And I know we've got to get going here in a couple minutes, probably. But um, yeah. I was in just in Quebec, and I was at the District House. And there was a movie that was just shot last year at the St. Joseph Center, which is where the SSPX is in Quebec. And they have, they bought a beautiful convent that civil government actually saved it because it was abandoned after the Second Vatican Council. But it was taken over by the city and was made a heritage site. So it was never renovated, which means it never got a table altar and never got rid of a high altar and everything was kept on tax dollar. So everything was, um, all the artwork was kept up like mil stuff, millions of dollars. And it, it was completely intact. And it's like a, it was actually um, by a traditionalist French magazine from France. It was called the most beautiful chapel on earth, not just a parish. Cause it's inside of a big building, the chapel oh. it's, you should go there one day. You can actually do retreats there. And it is the most beautiful little piece of heaven in the entire country. And, um, but there was a movie shot there. So a uh, Hollywood caliber movie in French 
and it was done and it was about the Christian brothers. And I saw a screening of it because only a few of us have seen it. And it's the whole story is, I won't tell too much, but it's about boarding school there where the Christian brothers and there's like a coming of age story of a young man. But because um, they had to have permission to use the place, um, uh, um, Father Couture, who was the district superior of Canada, he's from a wonderful French Canadian, truly French Canadian Catholic family. I, I so he a- was sort of, he was, you've met, okay, he's wonderful. He was sort of an unofficial co- um, consultant for the movie. They couldn't defend the faith and they couldn't offend the true history of Quebec in that movie. So a bunch of secular people shot this movie and I saw it. It's a wonderful movie just to watch dramatically and there's nothing in it that offends the faith and it actually exalts the French Catholic culture and it's going to be a big French speaking movie. Well, so it comes out, look for it. I will. Uh, and you, you may remember a few years ago, there was a song, I'm, I'm looking, for the, uh, looking for the lyrics. There was a song called uh, De Generation by a, uh, a band called Nozier. And it, it, it Messier rather. But if I, if I could find the, um, if I could find the lyrics, it, uh, it's very, very funny because it, uh, it starts out, I'll say it in English. Uh, your great, great grandfather, he cleared the land. Your great grandfather, he plowed the land. And worse, your grandfather made the land profitable. Worse, your father, he be, sold it to become a civil servant. Yeah. And, and it goes on, you know, contrasting uh, the old Quebec with the present one. Uh, it it, it yeah. really, uh, it goes on, you know, and you, my little girl, it says, um, your great grandmother, she had 14 children. Your, your great great grandmother, she had 14 children. Your great grandmother had almost as many. At worst, your grandmother had three, and that was enough. Your mother didn't want it. You were an accident. At worst, you change partners all the time, and when you uh, make a mistake, you go have an abortion. But there are mornings you wake up crying when you dream at night of a large table surrounded by children. Wow. That's pretty somber, and that's Quebec. Yeah, that is Quebec. And that... I mean, and it, and it it touches on a lot of other elements in society, a lot of other things, comparing our ancestors to ourselves. It's called Nozaya. Yeah, Mezaya is the name oh, of Mezaya. the band, okay. and uh, De Generation is the uh, name of the song, which is literally degeneration. I'm sure they mean it in a nice way. I just I, I realized I had your phone number, Charles. I just sent you some pictures of that place in Quebec and of the uh, procession in front of Parliament for your for your viewing pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, we'll it's, put those uh, on the video so the viewers should have seen that already by the time you uh, hear this. Okay, good. But uh, uh, Mr. Colomb, thank you so much for coming on. Any final thoughts, Quebec, then and now, New France? Well, yeah. I uh, One thing we never did touch on at all were the Cajuns, mm. who are the descendants of the Acadians who in 1755 were forced Mike, to leave. Mike Church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And they're, uh, they're to this day, Weirdly enough, although the lang- they've still somewhat held on to the language, although it's you know dying, but they certainly have managed, by and large, to hold on to the faith more yes. than we have. And uh, it's it's kind of interesting when you travel around Louisiana at Lent. You know, southern Louisiana, northern Louisiana is just regular Southern Baptist country, but the South, very French. Uh, and if there's if there's uh, what, anything that just cracks me up every time I see it, it's when you drive through there through the countryside of Louisiana and Lent, and there'll be signs over every restaurant with the uh, the saying eight reasons to dine with us during Lent," and it's their fish menu. Perfect. Yeah, they 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 they, they, they take that very seriously down there. Um, and similarly, having looking at that. Remember, gentlemen, nothing is dead until it's dead. Quebec is a long way down the drain, but it's not all gone. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the future generation, please God, will retake what my generation and uh, my father's generation took from them, stole from them. They were robbed. 
And I, I, you see, corrupts the optima pessime. The corruption of the best is the worst. And let us hope that this generation and the ones to follow make themselves worthy of the heroes that brought the faith and our genes to uh, to the new world. I um, I never knew that that Quebec. My dad did. I never did. Um, part of the reason why French New England collapsed was because Quebec collapsed. You know, they were they were it. Um, when you consider that, uh, we consider the great contributions that the French Canadians made in their great days. It's difficult to believe they can't somehow regain some of that. Oh, there's one other individual I got to mention before I forget. Uh, Marie Catherine, uh, Marie uh, Catherine Aurélie, uh, the foundress of the uh, of the uh, Sisters Adorers of the uh, Precious Blood. Very important lady in our history. Well, one day, Charles, when um, when the USSR allows us to travel between nations again, make your way to St. Joseph Center in Saint Jean Richelieu, in uh, outside of Montreal, and in this library of this where the DSSPX is located, they have original copies of every single volume of Bishop's letters to all of the diocese and the faithful in New France. So, and it's, you can sit there in the library, you can do a retreat there and you can sit there with a scotch and whatever and sit in the library and there, I saw them and they're all on the top shelf and you can go from like 1600 ish to now and you can read them all in the original French and you could, you could spend, uh, you know, you could spend the rest of your life there. And it's a, it's a historical, someone has to digitize those because I think they're the only place they actually inherited them from the diocesan churches because they didn't want them and the SSPX kept them. God bless them for that. It's, you know, well, one uh, one always wants to end on a uh, on a happy note, and I can say this about that: there is no season that I think more of French Canada than Christmas and New Year's. Uh, uh, in old in old Quebec, the gifts were given on New Year's, not on Christmas. Uh, and it's even now, it's this time of year when our identity still reasserts itself, I think. Uh, the winter carnival is coming. Well, um... So be of good cheer. Things will get better or, or maybe they'll get worse. But it doesn't matter because the thing to bear in mind, as my late father used to say, is that all of this is simply the historical backdrop against which we have to work on our salvation. And that, if we make it to heaven, gentlemen, this will be as close to hell as we ever get. Of course, if we go to hell, this is close to heaven as it's going to be. <laughs> so, well, that, that is a perfect way to conclude <laughs> this discussion. Make sure that you pick up Puritan's Empire, linked below from our friends over at the Tumblr House Tower. So uh, let's offer up uh, an Our Father for special intentions of those who are sick as well and for the rebirth of Catholic New France and Quebec. So, gentlemen, can you lead us in uh, the Our Father once again? En français? En français or in uh, English? Which, which would you prefer? Français. S'il vous plaît. Okay. All right. Au nom du Père et du Fils et du Saint-Esprit. Amen. Notre Père, qui es au ciel, que ton nom soit sanctifié, que ta reine vienne, que ta volonté soit faite sur la terre comme au ciel. Donne-nous aujourd'hui notre pain de ce jour. Pardonnez-nous nos offenses, comme nous pardonnons aussi à ceux qui nous ont offensés. Et ne nous soumets pas à la tentation, mais délivre-nous du mal. Du mal. Ainsi soit-il, nom du Père, du Fils, Saint-Esprit, ainsi soit-il. Amen.